true crime as a genre of like non-fiction media has really exploded with, I guess, the emergence of very popular podcasts. And these podcasts are often turned into Netflix documentaries primarily. So Aaron Hernandez, that was at first a podcast, a podcast that was much better. The Epstein stuff was also based on a podcast, which is far better than the documentary. And I myself would consider myself someone who likes like true crime and analysing criminal cases. But I'm more someone who consumes that like kind of like years later and find it interesting. But what happens when you have a community of people who absolutely love this stuff, who live and breathe this stuff, who often make it you know part of their personality? What happens when something that is kind of similar to stuff they've you know read about, listened to, or watched in the past is happening in real time? So today we're going to be talking about the disappearance of Gabby Petito and we're going to talk about the very tasteless reaction of some elements on the internet but also it's not just like tasteless, it's actually quite you know dangerous for people because in the past plenty of people have been accused by people on 4chan or Reddit or the internet in general of being linked to these active crimes which the police haven't solved yet and then basically getting doxxed, harassed, and sometimes even worse things. So we're going to talk about all of that today, and I'm going to give you examples of the sort of reaction I've seen online. Videos like this are demonetized, so please consider becoming a patron if you like my content at all. Also check out my Twitter, Discord, subreddit, and Instagram. All that stuff is in the description. Now I'm not saying anyone who likes true crime as this like subgenre of non-fiction is a bad person. I myself have enjoyed a lot of podcasts. I really, you know, enjoyed the quality of the ones about Aaron Hernandez, uh, Bill Cosby, uh, Jeffrey Epstein and people like that. It is absolutely horrific, these people and what they did. And especially with more high profile cases like Epstein, can it get more high profile and being linked to two former presidents? there are often a lot of questions that need to be asked about abuses of power. And similarly with Cosby, it's about abuses of power within entertainment. So I feel like those are important stories to delve deep into. And the Aaron Hernandez case, of course, has the underlying thing of, you know, these athletes are suffering immensely from uh, brain injuries a lot of the time, which is something that needs to be discussed further. So I feel good true crime tells you the details of a story that makes an overall point about society. But I feel like there's a lot of true crime which is just based on people, you know, learning perverse details or learning really horrific things that happen. And I guess smaller crimes that don't really need the coverage they often get, but it's like morbid curiosity, a lot of this stuff, rather than stuff that is important. So I guess for me, you know, stuff I found really interesting is like the Charles Manson cult, or the Black Dahlia murders in the 1930s and 40s. But I still think the stuff I've watched with that has played into my point about making a broader point about society, whether that is like the late 1960s in the US, or the wave of American servicemen returning from World War II and how that often increased crime rates. But today we're gonna to be talking about Gabby Petito, this ongoing investigation. Now I'm gonna use a BBC article because I don't wanna sensationalize this like many other outlets do. So what do we know about the case so far? The article says, blogger Gabby Petito embarked on a road trip this July with her fiance, Brian Laundrie. In the last few weeks, both have been reported missing and Mrs. Petito is now believed to be dead. What happened? On Sunday, police said a search crew had discovered a body matching the description of Miss Petito at a national park in Wyoming. Mrs. Petito, 22, was visiting the Grand Teton National Park with Mr. Laundrie, 23, as part of a cross-country camper van road trip. But after a month of traveling, Mr. Laundrie returned home to Florida without Mrs. Petito. Mr. Laundrie has now gone missing himself. He is considered a person of interest in the case, but has not been charged with any crime. Here's what we know so far. In July, they set off on a road trip from New York and they got engaged to be married in July, 2020. The two high school sweethearts documented their nomadic van life through national parks in the American West on Instagram and YouTube. The journey was intended to last four months. 
but Mr. Laundry returned home to Florida on September 1st. It's still unclear what happened when Mrs. Petito and later Mr. Laundry went missing, but some details have emerged from weeks prior. On the 12th of August, police in southern Utah called to a possible domestic violence incident involving the couple. Body cam footage shows Mrs. Petito crying and complaining about her mental health to officers. She also said the couple had been arguing more frequently. A police report of the incident said Mr. Laundry claimed Mrs. Petito hit him after an argument. The officers recommended they spend the night apart but did not file any charges. It is not yet known what happened next. On August 19th, a video was posted to a YouTube channel registered with Mrs. Petito's email. The video showed the couple smiling, kissing and running on beaches and has now been viewed more than 3.2 million times. Regular social media updates from the couple on Instagram abruptly ended in late August. Petito video called her mother on the 24th of August to say she was leaving Utah and heading to the Tatum Mountain Range in Wyoming, according to Rick Stafford, Petito's lawyer. Her mother, Nicole Schmidt, told CBS New York that she and Mrs. Petito would usually speak three times a week during the road trip. On August 25th, Mrs. Petito posted for the last time on Instagram with the caption, Happy Halloween. Her photo gallery did not include any location information. The last time Mrs. Petito's family heard from her was a text message on the 30th of August that read, No service in Yosemite, a reference to National Park in California. But Mrs. Schmidt has cast doubt over who actually sent the message. After a search that drew national public interest, officials discovered human remains believed to belong to Mrs. Petito in Wyoming's Grand Teton National Park on the 19th of September. A full forensic analysis is still required to confirm the body belongs to Mrs. Petito. An autopsy scheduled for Tuesday will determine the cause of death. Investigators have yet to disclose how and where the body was found. Mr. Laundry is currently the only person of interest in the case and he also remains missing. So obviously nothing has been solved yet. It does seem to indicate with a lot of murders of women that potentially her fiance did it because of his suspicious behavior, because of police witnessing some sort of domestic disturbance between them. Of course, we can't say exactly what happened, but that is a very common thing that happens across the world, that women who are murdered are often killed by their male partners. Now you can kind of see from, you know, the little details in the case, it's got everything for this like social media generation. It's got their own posts on social media. Petito's account has actually blown up from I think 1,000 followers on Instagram to 800K after she was missing. You have them trying to do this like van lifestyle and you've seen those types of YouTube channels before. So there's, you know, there was at least a lot of footage of them two together. And like people were saying, they can already see the Netflix documentary on this. And people were saying the streaming services probably can't wait to get the rights to some of this stuff to make this documentary considering there is so much evidence around it. Now, how the true crime thing comes in is that, you know, if people are already saying it sounds like a Netflix documentary, it kind of like blurs the line between like real horrific crimes and a someone's entertainment. So now I want to talk about the whole culture around this disappearance and how people have sort of acted like internet, uh, I guess, detectives. And you can judge really why they are doing this. Do they genuinely care about this one girl or... Do they just want to do it for social media clout? But just a small thing I want to touch on, which I'm going to get back to later. Of course, you know, there is the undercurrent of this being a pretty young blonde white girl who has posted a lot of uh, social media posts. So that is also, I think, playing into this whole story because loads and loads of non-white people go missing and they rarely get any coverage like this. So uh, Motherboard did a good article called Inside TikTok's Amateur Investigation into Gabby Petito's Disappearance. This is by Matthew Galt. And he's just talking about the stuff that people have been covering. So he says, you can, for example, learn about changes Petito made to a Spotify playlist around the time she disappeared. TikToker and Petito sleuth Hayley Tumayan said in a video, it has been reported that some really haunting songs, considering the situation, were added to Gabby's Spotify playlist the day after she sent the last text to her mum. The two minute clip effectively runs down the pertinent facts of the Petito case before transitioning to a discussion of song lyrics. It's the kind of thing you eventually see once you've spent the last few hours absorbing every detail you can about an ongoing missing persons case. This time, however, the open source investigation is occurring across a series of different social media sites with various videos and theories going viral over the last several days. A TikTok made by Miranda Baker, who claims she picked up laundry as a hitchhiker near where police suspect Petito went missing, has been viewed more than 9 million times. 
This is crazy. You're a big piece of this case, one commenter wrote, commenting to stay on the Gabby Petito TikTok. And I said, I swear, TikTok is going to solve this case before the FBI. Let's go, fam. So going back to Tumayan, among the Petito investigators is Tumayan, who ran a mundane TikTok channel full of life hacks and assorted musings until turning her attention to the Petito case. Now every new bit of information becomes two minutes of content that's viewed millions of times. The leads and details are overwhelming and infinite. On Facebook, someone posted a photo of a woman taken at a truck stop in Lodi, California, claiming it might be Petito. For a few days, relatives believe they found a picture of Petito in the background of a family photo taken at the Grand Tetons and posted on Facebook, but the rumor was disproved. And then just getting into more ridiculous stuff, Newsweek ran this headline. As authorities continued searching for Brian Laundrie, internet sleuths have pointed out footage of him reading a book about two women who go missing. In a video called Van Life, beginning our Van Life journey, posted to Petito's YouTube channel, Nomadic Static, on August 19th, Laundrie is briefly seen reading the book Annihilation, which you guys might know, uh, as a Natalie Portman film, by Jeff van der Meer. In the novel, four women traveled into an uninhabited area. Three of the women die and the fourth stays in the area permanently. Uh, the author actually responded, just going to say that Annihilation is not about missing women or anything else that is beginning to churn up on TikTok. Aidan Moher saying, this is quite possibly the strangest misreading of Annihilation I've ever seen. He was seen reading Lord of the Rings, a book about four hobbits who go missing from their peaceful village in the Shire. So like I said, you can kind of see there how this is being done for social media influence and clout. Why does that matter, Newsweek? You're meant to be like a somewhat reputable organisation. So this guy reading Annihilation probably doesn't factor into anything to do with this girl's disappearance. And of course, the TikTok stuff about Spotify playlists, it's just like clickbait. But you guys will know, if you spend a lot of time on the internet, um, especially if you're familiar with, I guess, YouTubers who are more like family friendly or for everyone, there are so many idiots. And think about all those clickbait channels, which literally just make stuff up about like unsolved mysteries or haunted houses and stuff like that. And how people just absolutely eat this stuff up and believe it's somewhat true. So Mashable also did a good article about this by Morgan Sung. And he says, Gary Petito's disappearance shouldn't be an internet true crime thriller. So he touches on two things. He touches on the subreddit and he touches on another weird page. The subreddit's more important. So I'm going to talk about this first because I've gone on it myself and it is very weird. So as of Friday, the tag Gabby Petito has 77 million views on TikTok and find Gabby Petito has 16 million. And the tag Gabby Petito update has 7.3 million. The subreddit Gabby Petito was created on September 13th and already has 33,000 members. I think it's nearly 100,000 now. And she's the subject of multiple threads in true crime, which has 611,000 members. So I want to go on the subreddit. And a lot of it really plays into this stuff where people just see this as like entertainment and something interesting in their lives. And there's people acknowledging people like me criticizing this stuff. And thankfully... There is a few rational people who are saying, you know, don't be internet detectives because it can lead to really bad results, which it has done in the past. So r slash Gabby Petito, and it has a description talking about the FBI's national hotline where they can receive tips. I'm sure all the tips from our um, Gabby Petito are going to be great for the FBI to solve this case. So every couple of hours, it seems, not even every day, there seems to be like a thread for talking about this and updates. And the thread is called Discussion Free, September 2021. So it's just a general discussion. I sorted by new. So it's just people like speculating on everything. So does anybody think potentially Brian coerced Gabby into taking the blame for the domestic violence incident by telling her that if she took the blame, it would blow over. And if the truth came out, he would be arrested. Narcissists can be extremely convincing at times. And I can see him being able to convince of this rapidly, especially if he had her under emotional control. Anyone else find it kind of weird that both Gabby's godmother and brother still follow Brian on Instagram? I know social media isn't everything, but still also notice that the brother went on a road trip with Gabby Petito and Brian in late June. Wonder if he picked up anything about their relationship. So this is just like ridiculous speculation. I'm sure the last thing that Gabby's godmother and brother are thinking when they hear about this is, yeah, better unfollow um, her boyfriend who may have murdered her on Instagram. So other stuff, anyone have a live feed of the FBI at Brian's sister's house? 
I keep seeing articles about the 911 call that caused Gabby Petito and Brian Laundry to be pulled over. Apparently, the call is clear that Brian was the aggressor because he slapped her or hit her. I can't find the actual call. Does anyone have a link? I'm just a random person in Texas. How do I help? Now, I like this comment especially, and it might seem like really throwaway, but it goes to show the mindset of a lot of these people is they're trying to insert themselves in this, you know, horrific death of someone. They want to be like the active detective, like Rust Colt from True Detective. They want to help this and solve this case themselves, despite really not being privy to probably all the facts the police and the FBI are. But, you know, they want to help and they want to do something. They want to feel a part of this movement. So I'm not sure about this take specifically, but do you think a lot of people just love this stuff because they've got nothing going on in their lives and they're really bored? Because that's what it seems like to me of a lot of this stuff, because... I get why it's an interesting case, but at the same time, I'm like, you know, happy enough to wait until it's been fairly solved and then just kind of forget about it because it's just one event that's happening. There's more important things to think about for me personally. So another one, what do you guys think of Brian's tattoos? I posted in Facebook and someone tried to say they, did, they were henna, but last time I checked, henna didn't last from February until August. Someone else saying, I looked through their pictures on Instagram. There was one of their hands and he had a vine with filled in leaves in his and hers were leaves that were not filled in. Yeah, and back in February, which is why I think they are tattoos, henna does not last that long. So here's a guy responding to criticism like mine. So uh, can people stop stating the obvious to signal their level headedness and moral superiority? Let's remember these are real lives. This isn't a Netflix movie. Reddit Boston Marathon bombing screw up should be required read for everyone here. One, you're wasting everyone's time. Two, people don't come to Reddit forums expecting the highest quality of ethics and journalism. Follow mod rules, share opinion theories and stay up to 1am reading the sub. Right? They admonish everyone else, but they're here for the same reasons. They're intrigued. People are stating it because arseholes are coming here complaining about not being entertained and not wanting to see spoilers. So at least there was one good post here. So it said, reminder, internet sleuthing, especially on Reddit, has a dark history. Now this case is different for multiple reasons and we have all our assumptions about what likely happened in the scenario for good reason. However, this subreddit has been a scary reminder for me of the Boston Bomber subreddit, which was like the worst thing to ever happen on Reddit. It resulted in the family of an innocent man whom was dead, being harassed, and was a contributing factor into the murder of an MIT policeman. If you have credible tips, send them to the appropriate party. Reality is the public is dealing with incomplete information and herd mentality plus confirmation bias. The internet has a horrid track record in these situations, and there's a high likelihood of some party parties being unfairly accused or sending misinformation to law enforcement be wary of the internet getting loose of accusing the family and bystanders of wrongdoing without solid ground. So I just want to talk about the Boston bomber thing because this was actually covered in 2013. So what it's like when Reddit wrongly accuses your loved one of murder. So in April, a family was grieving for their missing 22-year-old son, Sunel Tripathi, had been missing for more than a month. His roommate at Brown University hadn't seen him since March 16th. His mother, Judy, father, Akhil, and sister, Sangeeta, worked with Brown and the FBI to find him for almost eight weeks. They created a Facebook page, Help Us Find Sunel Tripathi, in case Sunel logged online. There, he'd find messages from loved ones praying for a safe return. In the middle of searching for their son, a new search for Sunel began on the 70 million member online community Reddit. In less than 24 hours, Sunel's name spread all over the internet as the face of one of the Boston Marathon bombers, but he wasn't guilty as his family would soon learn he was dead. In the haunting interview with the New York Times by J. Caspian Kang, Sunel's family revealed what it's like to be on the other end of a Reddit witch hunt, watching your innocent son get thrust into national spotlight and accused of a horrific crime. The Reddit community, which proved to be helpful in surfacing information during the Aurora, Colorado shooting, started a thread. Members began hunting for similar looking suspects online, trying to solve the mystery from computer chairs. Within minutes, brands worn by the bombers were identified on Reddit and 4chan, but then a user stumbled upon the Tripathi's family's Facebook page for Sunil. His photo was copy pasted next to a photo of the youngest bombing suspect and uploaded to Reddit. Along with the photo comparison, the user submitted information about the missing brown student. From there, misinformation and speculation spiraled out of control. Within hours, nasty commenters began invading Sunil's Facebook page. Later that night, when an MIT police officer was shot and killed, the messages became too much for the Tripathi family. They took down the page, which only further fueled Reddit and Twitter's fire. The internet fate of, of Sunil was finally sealed later when Euronon News, a Twitter news feed connected to the hacker collective, 
tweeted out his name to hundreds of thousands of people. He followed the account by 3 a.m. in many heavily trafficked corners of the internet. It was accepted that he was the number two bomber. Even though NBC's Pete Williams helped clear Sunil's name when he confirmed he wasn't one of the suspects, the damage had already been done. His sister was called 58 times between 3 and 4.15 a.m. The family told Kang it received hundreds of threatening and anti-Islamic messages. Groups that had been working with the Trapathi family to find their son shied away, thinking he might still be one of the bombers. So here was just a missing guy who was dead and suddenly people all over the world are confirming he did this horrific act. And that's why you have to be careful with this stuff. And this is why like internet sleuthing is dangerous. And while it's for people's entertainment, you don't really care about what happened. It seems to be just for people's gratification that they're really, really smart. Because like, you know, it's been said throughout this video, you don't have access to the same information that law enforcement do and the FBI do and stuff like that. And although you could potentially maybe help in certain circumstances, by and large, especially with something of this magnitude, which might have ties to like maybe, you know, foreign terrorist elements and stuff, you probably aren't going to work it out. So that is something to keep in mind all this stuff is that it's happened before other people got accused of doing something awful and then, you know, it ruined the family's lives for a long time. Now, the Mashable article goes on to talk about something else and it's this Gabby Petito Facebook page at Gabby.Petito and it says, the person who runs the Instagram page says there are a 20 year old student who wishes to remain anonymous, although the account is easily confused with Petito's own one, they said they didn't intend to mislead. They said the visually appealing, whimsical style of the text post they share wasn't meant to be insensitive or disrespectful, but to be eye-catching and easily shared in an effort to raise awareness. There's a stark dissonance between the pastel colors and the alarming text detailing the case. In just a little over 48 hours, our page has reached nearly 2 million impressions. So the creator behind the page said, truth be told, the style of the posts are not what really matters. What matters is we people are learning, understanding and spreading awareness on Gabby. So here are some of the posts. It is really weird, like the font and the background. So Brian is seen hitting, slapping Gabby and it talks about this. She touched the world, contrasting that. Northport loves Gabby and then this is now an active crime scene. So it, it does seem like very, very like tasteless and just like a weird choice, even if you are trying to raise awareness. Now that is all like the social media sort of clout chasing and general dangers of disinformation. So the point I wanted to end with is that generally people don't care about missing people unless I guess they're people they're familiar with or people the media really make a story around. So I just want to read some tweets and then just give my final verdicts. So the first one by Sherry Garcia saying, if Brian Laundry was black, we already know how this would have been playing out. Yunge Kim saying, we can mourn Gabby Petito while also recognizing that hundreds of indigenous women remain missing in Wyoming. We can feel sad for her family while remembering that the stories of missing black and brown women are rarely covered. All these women were victims who deserve better. And I never thought I'd be agreeing much uh, with the opinions of someone whose dad was in the Contras. So um, I'm glad Gabby Petito's disappearance has received so much coverage and there's been a vigorous investigation. My thoughts are with her family. I just want there to be the same interest and energy with every disappeared young woman in America, brown, black, Native American, and transgender. And one more post is there's someone who's recently gone missing. Um, so D-Day Blessed writes, it's a shame I have to compare, and I definitely sympathize with his family, but this missing person's case has only been going on for two days, and it's already received a hundred times more media coverage all over the world compared to my brother, Jelani Day. My brother's been missing since August 24th. That's 23 days. The FBI is even involved, even though my mother has been pleading for the FBI to intervene in my family's grief. We need help. My family's been emailing, calling, messaging, traveling, knocking on doors to find my brother. Please help us contact these major networks to bring awareness for my brother's safe return. It takes a village and I need you all together. We'll find him. So it's probably not surprising. Uh, Jelani Day is an African-American. So that probably plays into a lot of this stuff because there's a video of like the FBI announcing finding like the remains or the potential remains of, of uh, Petito and he's like choking up and crying. And that's of course like, you know, probably like a very real genuine moment. But it feels like for him and generally it's because they can relate to that because how many people in the UK or the US go missing um, when they're non-white essentially? 
who the police never really care about. Or investigations into murders that police don't care about. Like Stephen Lawrence is a very famous one in the UK, but there's so many in the US. And of course, you know, a lot of these murders are actually done by the cops themselves. But generally, I think that's a very good point, is that the media generally focuses on these, like, specific stories. And in essence, they do help, like, drive this agenda. So Gabby Petito, there's a combination of things, of course. You know, she documented this travel with her boyfriend on her Instagram and YouTube, and then it ends like this. So that's, like, a compelling story for people already. But of course, the point is, like, you know, these are two white people who seem like, you know, this normal, everyday couple... And then this is how it ends and like she is pretty and she's white and she's young. And I guess it's something that generally white Americans can feel more sympathy for where when it's like a black person, for example, a lot of their racial biases sort of come in while they might lay more blame on the victim. And of course, I even think I see this with the way we talk about Harvey Weinstein compared to Bill Cosby. Like, how many of you know how many victims Bill Cosby had or, you know, the black women who were victimised by him? Bill Cosby was a monster. And I don't think people realise this because it's really not been covered as much as someone like, say, Harvey Weinstein, whose targets were, um, you know, very, very wide ranging, but did include famous white celebrities. And even with Jeffrey Epstein's another example of this predator, um, mainly white people as well. So I feel like there is this like racial bias where the media, um, whether knowingly or not, doesn't really care about victims of crime when they aren't white by and large. And you also have to see how the media often spins things when black people are killed by police for no reason. So I thought I'd just end it on that note. So in conclusion is that I feel like it's pretty gross that people are viewing this whole case as like a, you know, a live Netflix documentary. And even in the past, like when you look at cases like the Black Dahlia, there is so much misinformation and like false tips to law enforcement. Imagine how bad this stuff makes all of it. And it's so sensationalized that if you're talking about um, this guy reading Annihilation or the victim's um, Spotify playlist, you really aren't helping anything. And it's clearly just a clout chaser and you're doing this for social media gain because you know this topic is going to be very popular. And the thing with the Boston bombing shows how this can seriously affect people who have absolutely nothing to do with these cases. Anyway, let me know what you guys think about all of this down in the comments. If you like the video, like it, maybe subscribe to the channel. If you wanna find me on social media, at the Cavernacle on Twitter and on Instagram, come join our communities on Discord and my subreddit, and maybe consider supporting my work on Patreon. And if you made it this far, thank you for watching.